And people ought to be really worried that these winners and losers are being chosen without their vote, you know, and in a way that doesn't involve uh, their expression of view. So that's step number one. Step number two, they need to start backing and insisting upon the kind of alternatives that address the fundamental problem. It's why, in spite of all the distractions, when I stand up and talk about economics, first thing I go into is the need to abolish the income tax and fundamentally restructure the financial system. Because those are the kinds of things that will produce real change in a direction that puts power back within the reach of our people. But people have to insist that it happen. Instead, what's happening in all the drip-drab ways, they're being bought off. The Democrats buy them off with promises of more government programs and more government spending and job training and all this nonsense to deal with the disaster that government itself is creating. And then John McCain stands up and says, oh, we'll raise the exemption to 7000 and let you keep a little bit more of your own money. Either way, people are being bribed to forget that the problem does not arise from these little driblets. It arises from the structures that we've allowed that have removed people, the people themselves, from the center of the power equation in this country. And, and I think until we get back control of our income and the national income in the sense that individuals are making the kinds of decisions as to the first use of their own dollar, we're not going to see this fundamental change. So I think those are concrete things that people need to be doing. And by the way, a couple of years ago, before the present sort of round of things began, People were waking up. They were focusing on these fundamental issues. You'll excuse me if I find it really convenient that as folks started to focus on these fundamentals, whether it was trade policy, the need for financial restructuring, the abolition of the income tax, suddenly we pretend we're overwhelmed now by all these problems that preclude fundamental change while people talk about nothing else but change. Well, if you could put together two, three, four book list that would bring the next generation into an awareness of what the fundamental issues are, what would that book list include? Huh. Hmm. Now, I, I pause because one would have to be really careful. I, I have found that, actually, I can't answer that question. No problem. The reason being that the book that people need to read is the one I haven't written yet. And it begins from recapturing the real meaning of economics in the life of our people. I'll be talking about that actually in a speeches that I'll be giving over the next several days. But along those lines, oddly enough, one of the first things that people would need to do is they would need to go back and make themselves familiar with an understanding of economics that predates anything like our current situation. And that would be to go back and familiarize themselves with the understanding that Aristotle has of what economic life was all about. And believe it or not, I think that that then begins to open the mind to the true problem we have. Because modern economics has been based upon an understanding that is entirely fictional about how human societies are. Things like the Keynesian analysis, the sort of silly notions of individual living on an island and all of these things that were the basis for then developing uh, theories uh, that essentially reflected, I think, a false and fictional understanding of, of human activity. The true unit of our economic life is the household. And that's, by the way, the literal meaning of economics. Ikos nomos was Greek for the rule or management of the household. And it points to the reality that the real unit of economic life and the one that we must think about in all its different aspects is the household, and the goal in a society like ours where freedom is the key and liberty is the key is this question. What contributes to the self-sufficiency of the household? And I think instead of trying to address that question these days, we've been going down a welfare state road that more and more puts households in a position of complete dependency on the government, now including dependency on the government for the very definition of what constitutes the household. This is a dangerous place to be. We had a guest last week who suggested that in order to maintain that self-sufficiency, American citizens would do well to have 
five silver coins in one pocket and perhaps a gold coin in the other, where a part of their family wealth, the household wealth, is something that is not subject to government fiat, not subject to rule changes in the middle of the game, that has been wealth for 5,000 years and has been the root of our economic system, uh, though a root that is very much underground and subterranean. I think that that is an important sort of suggestion or hint of, of the kind of thinking that we need to be doing, always understanding that even the gold and the silver are actually intended to remind us of something, and that is Mm -hmm. to remind us that our real wealth is based upon tangible things, right, material things that come out of the ground or that are grown in it, mixed with real talents and abilities that inhere in and must be developed by individuals in their proper capacity. Uh, That combination is real economic life. I think we've allowed ourselves to be caught up in what I think of as a kind of crematistic understanding of economic life, where the only reality is money, whereas in point of fact, money is a virtual reality. And unless it is tied to and truly reflects what is going on in the real situation, eventually the money bubble will collapse. And I think that's sadly what's going to happen in America, because we are allowing ourselves to be led down roads in which concrete and tangible realities are being destroyed by unequal trade agreements, by the income tax system and other things, more and more and more of what is needed to develop and maintain the self-sufficiency of the true economic unit is being actually destroyed, eroded and destroyed. And eventually we will pay a huge price for that because our country will be, in economic terms, a hollowed-out appearance rather than a really substantive uh, reality. Dr. Keyes, we're about two and a half generations away from the generation that had to actually financially experience the last Great Depression. And it seemed like two divergent paths occurred at that time. You were talking about the households becoming self-sufficient. People who went through the Great Depression were forced into that situation, and it seemed that it really refined and built an integrity into the way that generation thought and learned to save. And then at the same time, the government massively socialized from the top down. So do you see possibly with the crisis that we're in right now, the pain that we're probably going to feel financially over the next few years as an opportunity to have that integrity built back into the system and possibly you know, recover that uh, self-sufficiency that you're talking about for the households? I definitely think with the right kind of leadership, it is an opportunity, yes. Yeah. But in order for us to understand that opportunity, we'd have to look at what you just talked about in terms of its foundational truth. I remember some time back uh, hearing about, because they wouldn't let me get involved in a debate, I think it was the Michigan debate among the Republicans, and one of the questions they asked was prefaced with the notion that economic things, uh, money things, are is the, is the most important issue in American life, right? But mm-hmm. when you look back at something like the Great Depression, when the economic things went all awry, what actually sustained the people of this country through that great economic crisis. It was not their material well-being that did so. It was their moral understanding. Mm -hmm. And that's what made it possible for them to both rediscover and build up the kind of responses that in the households and in the families and in the structures of, of reliance and mutual cooperation and help helped people to get through bad situations when everything material seemed to be falling apart. That is the fundamental thing we are forgetting in this country, that at the end of the day, our strength rests not upon material factors, but upon moral and spiritual strength. And we are allowing those things to be assaulted in an absolutely fundamental way that is depriving us even of the desire for self-sufficiency and responsibility. This is what is frightening turning us into clients of a totalitarian government entity that at the end of the day will so control and redefine us that our very sense of ourselves will be a sense of ourselves as a people without 
the ability to care for ourselves without dependence on that government and without the courage or sense of responsibility to do so. Because at the end of the day, it requires courage to accept responsibility for yourself. And it requires a kind of fortitude uh, to accept the discipline that goes along with building that self-sufficiency. And all these things are today being undermined, I think, quite systematically. In a moral sense, in an educational sense, uh, we are going down a path which actually destroys the characteristics needed.